Okay, we have a practice quiz today. And then one of the questions that I'm going to ask later on is for the, uh, from the mock test that I gave you yesterday. Uh, this is a calorimetry question, the first one. And, I, and the question I ask, a perfectly insulated bucket of water, and I give the density of water and the heat capacity, the specific heat capacity of water, holds 13.0 liters at 29 degrees Celsius. A cube of iron, 15 centimeters high, is heated to 193 degrees Celsius and is placed in the water. Um, and I give you the density of iron and the specific heat of iron. Assuming all of the specific heat capacities remain constant over the temperature range of the experiment, what is the final temperature? So we have to recall the first law of thermodynamics, which states that heat is uh, energy is neither created nor uh, destroyed. So any of the heat that's lost by the hotter object is going to be absorbed by the colder object. In this case, the colder object is the bucket of water. And we say that it's perfectly insulated, so we're going to assume that none of the energy leaks out of the bucket as would happen in a real world experiment. So we're going to create an artificially perfect experiment. The first, the first step in solving this problem is to find out how much iron we have in grams. So we're going to use the density equation. Density equals mass over volume. We transpose volume to get the mass. Here's the density of iron. Here is uh, the height of the cube. Notice I cubed this value, which means I've cubed the number and I cubed the unit. So it's 15 times 15 times 15 because the cube is length times width times height. That gives me the volume of the cube in centimeters cubed. Multiply the volume times the density and you get the mass. So it's a 26 kilogram cube of iron. Uh, I did the same thing with water. Found out that the, using the fact that water has a density of 1, that there's 13 liters of water. I converted from liters to milliliters and I converted cc's to milliliters. They're interchangeable. Cc's is just another way of saying centimeters cubed. You see that typically written on the side of a syringe, but it just means centimeters cubed. The same as this. So the, uh, the units are interchangeable. So we have 13,000 grams of water, and we'll set up an equation where we say that the heat lost by the iron is equal to the heat gained by the water. And then we simply replace the Q, which, which is a symbol of heat flux, with mc delta t, because we recall that Q is equal to mc delta t. So we replace both of those variables. And then we plug in the values of each one of the things that we calculated. The mass of the uh, iron, the heat capacity of the iron, and the temperature change, which now we've replaced. Instead of putting delta T, we put Ti minus Tf here. So we just keep the values positive by putting the bigger number first. And we'll worry about the sign conventions after the problem is over. 193 is the starting temperature of the, water, of the iron, and it's going to cool down until it reaches the same temperature as the water which is warming up. So the temperature final of the water ends up being uh, higher than the, than the temperature initial, which is 29. So you notice how I switched switch those two variables. That's simply to keep it positive, to get positive numbers. It just makes it easier to do the problem if you, if, if you uh, keep everything positive and then worry about the sign conventions at the end. I've, over the years, I've noticed that when students are asked to keep track of the sign conventions during the solving the problem, they end up making mistakes because they end up putting the wrong, the neither sign in the wrong place. So to remedy that, I prefer that you do the calculation without worrying about the sign conventions until the very end, and then just recall that if something is exothermic, then the sign convention is for it to be negative. Negative heat means the process is exothermic, whereas positive uh, value of Q means the process is endothermic. Better to just remember that fact than to worry about the whole mathematics of it all the way through. Anyway, we do the algebra, we get the Tf is equal to this over that. What, we, what we've done is transposed all the variables containing Tf on one side. We've distributed the numbers into the brackets. Everything with Tf was on one side, all the numbers on the other side. We solve for Tf, and we get to T of 0.223. So the final temperature of the water, we're only allowed three significant figures, is going to be 58.2 degrees Celsius. The second problem, which is over here, is a problem that requires the use of S's law. We have four equations um, that are listed, each with their attendant uh, delta H. And here's the delta H of formation of um, diborane, I think it's called. Diborane and trioxide. So we want to find the heat of formation of this substance. 
Notice heat of formation means uh, the heat that's released or absorbed when something forms from it, the elements that compose it. So the first step is to look at what we need to set up our target equation starting from these four other equations. We see that there's boron. And there's one, other, one equation that contains boron all by itself. It's equation number four. So what I did is I wrote number four, equation number four, as is. Exactly the way it appears. And it has the same energy cost, 36 kilojoules. The second step, I, I said flip number one. And I said flip number one because I wanted to uh, find something that was going to have B2H6 as a product. And number one has that's right. No, what I wanted is something that would eliminate B2H6. See, the first equation has B2H6 in it, but my target equation has no B2H6. So I took number one and I flipped it because B2H6 appears as a product in number one. I want it to appear as a reactant. So when I flip number one, B2H6 appears on the left, which will allow me to cancel those two in the future. When I flip an equation, I also have to change the sign on its enthalpy. So it's going to become negative 2035. And the next step was to look for something that would eliminate the hydrogen that appears in equation number four. Number four has three hydrogen atoms, and my target equation has no hydrogen. So I looked for an equation that had hydrogen in it, and that was number three. But number three was in the wrong order, and I needed three times as much hydrogen. I need three hydrogens to be eliminated. So I flipped number three, and I multiplied it by three. And of course, I, I reversed the sign on the enthalpy, and I multiplied it by three. So it was negative. 286, it becomes positive 286, and then multiply it by 3. And then the last step, I want to eliminate uh, the liquid water that appears in equation number 3, because there's no liquid water, as you see in the target equation. So by eliminating liquid water, uh, by using number uh, equation number 2, which, which is the only one that contains liquid water, I again had to flip it and multiply it by 3, because there's 3 liquid waters in equation number three. So by flipping number two and multiplying by three, I generate three waters that will allow me to eliminate water. Once I've done all those steps, I've used all the equations, I can start crossing out everything that I don't want to appear in the target equation. So we see that uh, liquid water disappears. It appears on the left and on the right. If it appears on the left and right, then you're allowed to cross it out. Gaseous water also appears on both sides. B2H6 appears on both sides. Um, the H2 gas, three of them on, the si on both sides, disappear. And the only tricky thing here might be where you have three oxygens on the left and three, three over two oxygens on the right. That too will partially um, eliminate. You're going to be left with three over two oxygens on the left because 3 minus 3 over 2 gives you 3 over 2. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So we're left with 2 borons, 3 over 2 oxygens, and B2 over 3, B2, B2O3 as our final product. See? Here, here, and here are the only things that have been crossed out, and that's our target equation. Then you do the math. You add up all the numbers, 36 minus 2,035, plus 3 times 286, plus 3 times negative 44, you get a final answer of negative 1,273 kilojoules. That's the enthalpy of formation for um, diboron trioxide. The third equation, we are shown the combustion of butane. So when we do a combustion equation, we, re we recall that complete combustion results in the formation of carbon dioxide and water exclusively if there's sufficient oxygen. So when we balance combustion equations, we always follow it alphabetically. First the carbons, then the hydrogens, then the oxygens, and all combustion equations are very easy to balance if you follow that simple rule. So there are four carbon atoms in butane, so let's balance it by writing four carbon dioxides on the right. That gives us four carbons, so the carbons are balanced now. Butane has ten hydrogens, so we're going to put five waters on the right. Now we worry about balancing oxygen. 
5 oxygens plus 8 oxygens gives you 13 oxygens. How do you get 13 oxygens when they come in pairs? 13 over 2, O2 is going to balance the oxygens. We now have a balanced equation. We're told that the, uh, the heat of combustion of butane, which is the delta H of reaction in this case, is negative 2877 kilojoules per mole of butane burned. You have to be careful when you write kilojoules per mole. Uh, and I didn't take my own advice here. Uh, negative 2877 kilojoules per mole of butane burned. If you say just two, negative 2887 kilojoules per mole, which one are you talking about? Is it the CO2? Is it the water? Well, it's four moles of CO2. It's 13 over two moles of O2 being used, so you have to be, you have to be specific. If not, then you, you have to just say negative 2877 kilojoules, and don't write per mole, per mole, unless you're ready to specify the actual chemical that you're talking about. So the question is, what is the delta H of formation of butane as calculated from the data above? And then later on, it asks how much energy would be released by the combustion of 50 kilograms of butane. So in this case, the delta H of reaction is the same as the delta H of combustion. This is a combustion reaction. So the, the delta H for this reaction, which is 2,877, is for the heat of combustion. And as we recall, it's, uh, it can be calculated using the heat of formation of the products minus the heat of formation of the reactants. So I always advise that you make two big square brackets. You put the products in one and the reactants in another. These are the stoichiometric coefficients of the balanced equation. So I see five waters. There's the heat of combustion, uh, the heat of formation for water, for the five outside. There's the heat of formation for carbon dioxide with a four because the stoichiometric coefficient of in this balanced equation is four. X represents the uh, heat of formation of butane, which is what we're trying to find. We don't know the heat of formation of butane. The heat of formation of any element in its standard state is zero, so that's why we have zero here. Then we do, just do the math, solve for x, we find out that the heat of formation for butane is negative 125.2 kilojoules per mole of butane formed. Then in the second question we're asked if you burn 50 kilograms of butane, uh, how much energy is released? So we find we convert kilograms to grams, we divide by the molar mass of butane, and we find out there's 860 moles of butane, and then we multiply by the uh, heat of combustion of butane, not the heat of formation. If you, if, you, if you multiply by this, you'll get the wrong answer. We have to use this number. So 860 times that gives you negative 2,474 megajoules, which I then reduced into uh, gigajoules by dividing by a thousand. Remember, it's a thousand megajoules per gigajoule. We're only allowed three significant figures, as far as I can see. 